Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, just before we get started, I'd like to make a brief land acknowledgement. The Guild University is on land which has long served as a site for meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous people whose presence marks this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. So we're very fortunate Dr. Jay Brophy filled in uh, quite at the last minute as our speaker had to cancel. And so I'm very happy uh, that Dr. Brophy, my colleague, uh, um, it was able to join us today. Uh, Dr. Brophy is well known to most of you. He is a tenured professor at McGill in the Division of Cardiology, Epidemiology and Biostatistics. His research interests are eclectic and include cardiovascular epidemiology, Bayesian statistics, health technology assessment, and decision making. His research has been partially supported by Fonds de Recherche de Santé Québec, Chair in Health Technology Assessment Research and Evidence-Based Medicine. According to Google Scholar, Dr. Brophy has published over 400 articles with 28,000 citations and an H index of 62. It's always a pleasure to be to work with Dr. Brophy. I know residents enjoy rounding with him because he really understands uh, research and the interpretation of research is not always what you're going to see uh, when you read the editorials of the journals, including journals like the New England Journal of Publication. We've had a lot of discussions on some of the clinical trials that have been published even in high impact journals. So it's always a pleasure to hear Dr. Brophy speak. Thanks for being here today, Jay. All right, thank, you. thank you very much, Nadia. Um, so the learning objectives are to understand some of the strengths and weaknesses of different research designs uh, in general. And then a little bit more specific is to look at the current evidence base comparing different DAPA, that's dual antiplatelet therapies, which are uh, the standard in cardiology for people who come in with acute coronary syndromes, and also to look at some uh, new research evidence uh, generated uh, within the walls of the MUHC and see how that fits into the totality of our uh, uh, knowledge. All right. So um, first uh, acknowledgement is that a lot of this work uh, comes from uh, one of my uh, former PhD uh, students uh, from, his, uh, from his thesis. Uh, first, some background. Of, um, we're we're going to see a number of uh, these forest plots. Uh, um, I, I'm sure for most of you, this is uh, really old hat, but there may be some people that aren't quite familiar with it. Each one of these lines represents a study. Uh, the Square represents the point in estimate from the study. The line is a 95% confidence interval. Uh, the size of the square is, determines, uh, is determined by the sample size. And of course, as the sample size gets bigger, our confidence intervals get more narrow. And then we're interested always, we go and we want the bottom line, which is combining all these studies, right? And we get an improved precision by doing that. Uh, and we're looking here on a multiplicative scale. So uh, we're looking for, uh, <clears throat> are we to the left or to the right of one, or do we include one? And uh, if we're totally to one side or the other, it means the exposure either increases or decreases risk. Okay. It, it all seems kind of simple, uh, but there's actually a whole bunch of decisions that are made behind the scenes about which model do you use? Uh, because it's not only about the data, right? We always just talk about the data, but the data is nothing until we start trying to make inferences. And when we try to make inferences, we're automatically assuming a mathematical model, some mathematical model. We might not know that we're doing so, but we are, okay? And the mathematical model is attempting to enlighten us into better understanding and decision making as it aims to sort of replicate the data generating mechanisms. Now, there are lots of different models that can, can be used, right? And this graph is really quite interesting. Uh, I think it was 70, uh, 73 different research teams were asked to evaluate the same hypothesis, and they were given the same data. 
right? And they said, go for it, do your analysis. And as you can see, um, you know, 25% said that the, uh, they had, this, you know, statistically significant findings against the hypothesis. <laughs> Excuse me, 17% said they had statistically significant uh, proof for the hypothesis and the remainder were, um, it was inconclusive. <laughs> All that to say, it's the same data. The model matters, okay? So when we do meta-analysis, we're essentially looking at two different models. A fixed effects model, which sort of says there is between study variation, or excuse me, there is within study variation, but there's no between study variation. It's all the same population. I, I think that there are very few cases when that's actually true. Uh, more likely it's a random effects model where you have within study variation, but you also have between study variation, which makes sense. The patients are different. The investigators are different. Ancillary treatments may be different from study to study. So, you know, I think we really want us to be thinking about random effects models. Now, if there is no between study variation, it will reduce down to a fixed effect. So you have nothing lost. But you don't have to do this sort of analysis just on when there are different studies. One could imagine a study where there are um, a large international study where there are um, maybe 40 different countries which are randomizing uh, individuals into from six different geographic regions around the world. And it might be more appropriate to be looking at the estimates for each of those separate geographic areas, and then figuring out an intelligent way of pooling them together, rather than thinking that everyone who comes from Bulgaria is equal to everyone who comes from New Zealand is equal to everyone who comes from North America. I just throw that out as a, as a something to think about. So with that background, um, and that's about as heavy as we're going to get into the statistics. Well, that's not true, but I will say that anyway. Um, the, the, the PICO question for this research was, uh, is uh, a DAP regime of uh, Tiagrelor and aspirin superior to clopidogrel and aspirin for reducing cardiovascular events in patients who undergo a PCI after an acute coronary uh, syndrome admission? So the population, uh, we're looking at acute uh, <coughs> coronary uh, uh, patients. The intervention is Tigrelor, um, and the comparator is clopidogrel. And the outcome is, as in the RCTs, uh, death or cardiovascular uh, hospitalizations. Right? But so somebody might say, but well, this question has already been answered. You know, tell us something new. Uh, because there was a big study uh, published in the New England, 2009 now. And, uh, you know, all you need to know is the p-value is uh, 0001. So, you know, the, the question has been answered. And you can see the <laughs> Kaplan-Meier curve in the upper right. Uh, tiger lore does, does better. Uh, the hazard ratio was uh, 0 0.84 confidence intervals, the upper limit was 0 0.92, so it doesn't touch one. Uh, everything has already been answered. Well, and, and indeed, for certain people, it has been answered. Uh, starting in uh, 2012 and again in uh, 2018, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society says we recommend Tiagrelor over clopidogrel. They're categoric, okay? A strong recommendation, high quality evidence. Okay. Um, but not everybody is totally on board with that, uh, including the FDA originally. When this was first presented to them in 2010, I think, they refused to approve Tigrelor. Uh, they finally accepted it a year later. Uh, there were dissenting opinions. It was um, like a split decision, 6-4, in, in favor of approving it. The, the issues that, they, that the FDA had is the lack of robustness for Tigrelor in uh, the U.S. or North America setting. And you can see that with that 
forest plot there, where in uh, Asia and Australia, there was a, the point estimate is on the good side of one in favor of tiger lore. Um, in, in Europe, uh, where the bulk of the patients uh, were recruited, uh, it was also um, not only on the good side, but statistically significant. Not surprising, they had a large sample size. But in North America, uh, while the confidence interval includes one, the point estimate is on the wrong side. The point estimate was a 25% increase. Not statistically significant, but there is a statistically significant difference compared to the other geographic areas. And the, there was another concern that when the investigators did the adjudication, and this is overall, there was no effect for tiger law. It was only after the sponsor did adjudications that it became uh, significant. And this is shown here uh, <clears throat> where the different uh, uh, <clears throat> regions are divided according to whether the study was adjudicated uh, by the sponsor or by a CRO. And it was only in the areas that were adjudicated by the sponsor did we have this um, uh, significant uh, benefit for tiger lore. Now, this could just be the play of chance, so I'm not making a big deal about it. But all that to say is there is still some uncertainty, even though you have a small p-value. And indeed, uh, I, I took their data by geographic area, and rather than just uh, you know pooling it the way they do, they're, they're pooling it essentially like a fixed effects that everybody's the same. Right. And, uh, and and so they have very little variation. If you instead look at and try and be a little bit more personalized uh, and sort of say, well, you know, patients in North America are more like patients in North America and patients from Eastern Europe are more like patients from Eastern Europe and try and analyze it in that sort of manner. You end up where you see the second line from the bottom where this, the point estimate is still in favor of uh, tiger lore, but because we're now accounting for the between region variation, we have more uncertainty, right? And so the, the, that red line crosses one. <coughs> the predicted one is actually something that we don't usually show in these forest plots, but it's actually very interesting because that's the predicted value for the next study because the red line is giving you a prediction for what the mean might be. And as you recall, the difference between when you're predicting a mean and predicting for a population is different by the square root of n. Uh, on the right is taking this data and applying a non-informative prior and looking at this in a Bayesian light, because I feel that that just gives us a little bit better insights into what the data is telling us. And so the data from uh, <clears throat> Plato, totally dominated by the Plato data, the, the prior is contributing nothing to this. You can see it's about, if you accept that plus or minus 10% is really uh, clinically insignificant, you can call that a region of practical equivalence. That's the white area here. It's about 33%. And it's about a 20% chance that actually Clopidogrel is better, and about a 50% chance or a coin toss that a tiger lore is better. That's based on the seminal study that, uh, that has driven all the guidelines. So um, that's just another graphic and showing it. When you do a, a, a hierarchical uh, meta-analysis, you borrow information and that allows us to pull the US data down a little bit more towards the overall mean. And, and you know, it helps rather than being obliged to, like the FDA was sort of in a, between a rock and a hard place and they didn't really know what to do here. They could either take the 18,000 patients, the whole trial where everyone is treated as being the same and with that very small p-value would say, yes, we're all in. Or they could say, no, we want to be a splitter. We just want to look at the U.S. data. Okay, that's more representative, but you're throwing away 90% of your data. 
So that's kind of not very satisfactory either. But there is middle ground, and this is called hierarchical modeling, where you can borrow information between the studies. And really, that's what they should have done. And if you borrow the information, the U.S. data doesn't become quite as, as, as extreme, as much of an outlier. But what happens is, um, again, on the bottom line, is the point estimate is still in favor of tiger lore, but we have this uncertainty that is increased. And the New England paper reported that line here where they said there is no difference between regions. Everyone's identical. All the investigators are identical. It's a, essentially a fixed effects model. And if you do that, the point estimate and the uncertainty is very tight. If you start trying to use a model which accounts for more uncertainty, you end up with wider confidence intervals. Anyway, that was a background that I had played with and I sort of said, well, we should really try and investigate this a little bit uh, further. So the first thing we did is to try and do a systematic review because in the interim, many studies had been published about uh, Tigralor. And so, uh, <clears throat> The first uh, paper we, we attempted to do was a systematic review and a Bayesian network meta-analysis of that following ACS. Okay, so here the network meta-analysis is that we're looking at all the different agents uh, and that is essentially Prazogril, Clopidogril, and Tigralor. Uh, and we're not only looking at the direct comparisons, say Tigralor to Clopidogril, but if there are any trials that compare Tigrelor to Prazogril and then Prazogril to uh, Clopidogril, we can get an indirect estimate also of uh, Tigrelor to uh, Clopidogril. So we can get both direct, if the study has been done, comparisons, and we can get indirect evidence, right? And that's the whole idea of a, of a network meta-analysis. And so we reviewed 5,000 papers and found about 17 trials um, that uh, address this issue. Uh, you can see there were nine trials that have compared Tigrelor to Clopidogrel, five uh, Prazogrel to uh, Clopidogrel, and three between uh, Prazogrel and, and Tigrelor. And when you do that uh, analysis, you using all the data that's available, whether you just consider the direct studies or you include the indirect studies into the network meta-analysis, obviously when you include the direct and indirect, the network has become some more precise and you can see that by the confidence intervals being smaller for each one of the network things. But in each of these cases, you know, it goes across one. So we didn't have any evidence from this Bayesian network meta-analysis of all published RCTs that there's any uh, benefit for MACE, uh, one agent uh, compared to clopidogrel or another agent compared to clopidogrel. Um, and this is just the, the actual data um, that went into the trials. You'll notice this is what we said when we looked at the random effects, pyrrole versus uh, clopidogrel, prazogrel versus <coughs> clopidogrel, across one, uh, no difference. But that's because we did the Bayesian meta-analysis using a random effects model. If you use the fixed effects model, both Tigrelor and Prazogrel look superior uh, to um, uh, Clopidogrel. So again, same data, but depends on what sort of model you're gonna use and the assumptions you're making that underline the choice, your choice of model. <coughs> Here, this is just, and because this is a Bayesian meta-analysis, we can talk about actual probabilities, which you can't do in a, in a frequentist analysis. And it's sometimes, I think, helpful to have this in a, in a graphical format. And you can see here, these are the probability uh, density functions for uh, <clears throat> Prazogrel versus uh, Clopidogrel in the sort of uh, uh, mustard yellow and in the blue, it's uh, Tiagrelor versus uh, Clopidogrel. You can see the point estimates, the highest point on both sides favor the, uh, the experimental drug over uh, Clopidogrel. But there, there is area under the curve, which is proportional to your probability, on the other side in both cases, right? 
So, you know, while it looks from this Bayesian meta-analysis that, yeah, there's a signal from uh, both of these drugs that they're maybe superior to uh, clopidogrel, I, I think I would be hard-pressed to say it's strong or compelling evidence uh, for from a guideline point of view. It's, it's interesting that, um, you know, from a point estimate point of view and uh, the overlap of the curves, actually, Prazogrel looks a little better than Tigerlar. But Prazogrel never really gained a foothold very much in, in Quebec and really in North America. Uh, and we can discuss maybe why that was. There, there was the, one of the original studies had more strokes in elderly people and, and, and females, et cetera, and low body weight. And maybe that was what uh, made clinicians uh, uneasy. Maybe it was the great marketing done by Tigerlor. I don't know whatever reason, but clearly Tigerlor was the alternative to uh, clopidogrel. And that's why we concentrated uh, on uh, looking at Tigerlor versus clopidogrel and kind of left the uh, prazogrel by the side. As expected, both the new drugs, when you look at the Bayesian meta-analysis, have a slight tendency for increased bleeding, um, but you know, barely. Uh, it's the same picture again, for only for bleeding. We can skip that. So the conclusions of the Bayesian uh, <laughs> network meta-analysis were, when compared to clopidogrel, prazogrel, and tigerlor, were associated with moderate and uh, modest uh, probabilities in uh, uh, in clinically meaningful MACE reductions. Uh, they uh, both had uh, uh, decent probabilities of increasing uh, bleeding. And despite guidelines, um, the net clinical benefit of these drugs compared to clopidogrel appears modest, uh, but there is still residual uncertainty. Uh, I think we would like to have, uh, you know, a, a better field than just, you know, it's, coin toss or it's 80% probable, we'd like to have something a little bit more um, secure and more precise. Um, there's also uncertainty as to, you know, uh, the bulk of the studies from uh, Tigerlor uh, compared to clopidogrel came from uh, other regions of the world. Um, there were 18,000 patients in Plato, about 1,800 were from North America. And after that, there were no other patients randomized in North America to Tigerlor versus clopidogrel. There were studies done in Japan. There were studies done in other uh, countries of the world, but nothing done in North America. And you'll recall that in North America, in Plato, there was a 25% increase in MACE uh, for uh, uh, Tigerlor. So, you know, so that, that's the, the, the Bayesian meta-analysis. Of course, there are caveats um, that we have to be careful when you look at a, at a meta-analysis. Uh, was the systematic review well done? Was it, did it take into account the quality of the studies? These were all RCTs and all reasonably well performed. Uh, did we, you know, did you look for heterogeneity? Uh, is there reporting biases? All these sort of things that uh, have to be taken into account. <laughs> Excuse me, before you can take a a meta-analysis to the bank. But nevertheless, uh, I'm not putting all our eggs in this one analysis, but I'm just showing you that one of the ways of looking at this question is doing this systematic review and, and Bayesian meta-analysis. And from that, we don't have any compelling evidence. Um, these are just some of the reporting biases that you can see. So another, well, another research design that we could take and we did take to try and address this question of the, the comparative effectiveness of clopidogrel and, ty and tigerlor uh, was uh, to do a real world, uh, that's, that's code for observational, you know. <laughs> it somehow sounds like it's suddenly okay because it's real world. And of course there are a ton of biases when you get into doing observational research, but nevertheless, we thought, okay, we're going to cover all our bases. We did the, the, the meta-analysis. We're going to now do some uh, of our own observational research. So we used the uh, uh, RAMQ uh, databases. Um, and they're a little old because it was like from 2012 when it came on the market to only 2018. Because after 2018, you have to now go dance through so many hoops, it's almost impossible to get RAMQ data. Um, so... 
you know, but anyway, it is what it is. We had uh, uh, about um, 20, 20,000, 20 odd thousand, 21, 22,000 people who had an ACS and then received either clopidogrel or tigrelor afterwards. Um, this was a baseline data for those uh, for that uh, cohort of uh, Quebec patients. Uh, you can run down the column on uh, any feature you look at. The uh, uh, clopidogrel uh, patients were sicker. They were older, uh, had more uh, more comorbidities, were treated at an earlier time period, and presumably PCI, et cetera, has gotten a bit safer over time. So, you know, these there, there's a lot of in balance between these two groups, right? But since we have those factors, we can at least correct for those factors. We can't correct for the unknown ones, but we can correct for the measured ones. And this is the standardized mean difference between the groups. And we can see that before we do any adjustment, there's big difference between the uh, tiger lore group and the clopidogrel group. After we do some propensity score matching, we have pretty good matching between the, the groups. So the groups are, are very comparable for the measured confounders, right? We don't know anything about the unmeasured ones. If, if they are different and if they are, they're still different even after our propensity scores. So what did we see? Well, just really concentrate on the, on the, on the top line and the bottom line. Uh, for our... <coughs> uh, MACE uh, component, which is the same MACE as used in the, uh, uh, in the trials, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke and, and mortality. You can see that the hazard ratio, uh, 0 0.66, uh, quite strongly in favor of Tigerlor. Uh, however, you'll remember that the uh, unadjusted groups were wildly different uh, with the clopidogrel being much sicker. So when we adjust for that, uh, and get an average treatment effect using our propensity scores. Uh, this uh, pulls the estimate up to 0 0.91. The confidence interval uh, does cross one. Um, when you look at bleeding, uh, again, uh, not much to choose from. It's pretty much centered at one uh, and uh, uh, you know, looks pretty normally uh, distributed, equal a uh, chance of it being an increase or a decrease. Now, bearing in mind that, you know, this is only uh, uh, 20,000 patients, and maybe if we had a bigger sample, some of these uh, things might have become statistically significant. But I think we can say from this observational study, which has the benefit of at least being local, um, we don't have a strong signal in favor either of improved cardiac outcomes, improved NACE, or of increased bleeding with Tigerlor. So now we've gone looking at the key study of PLATO. If we change our model, we're not so convinced about the um, superiority of uh, Tigerlor. If we do a network meta-analysis, we remain uncertain as to the benefit of the tiger lore. If we do our local observational study, we remain uncertain, but all of those three all have their limitations. So what would be the next step? Well, it would be to do an RCT, right? So that's what we did. Um, this is the, what we already talked about. Uh, <coughs> So we did a, an RCT um, called TC4, Tigerlor compared to clopidogrel in acute coronary syndromes. And this is a pragmatic clustered randomized controlled trial. Uh, you, you know, the PLATO, I don't have the exact figures, but it's somewhere north of $100 million, that study, right? So we're doing an RCT here, and CHR is like giving us Two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars and complaining. So, you know, there, there, we have to make some kind of uh, hopefully sensible design uh, choices along the way. And given the the number of people that intervene in a uh, in a, in an acute setting, one, rather than randomizing individual patients as they came in, because you know the person in the ER, then they're transferred to the, the to the 
cardiologist on call, then they go to the cath lab and the interventionalist. You know, there's lots of places where people can change back and forth. And, and so what we did is we did this as a clustered randomized trial where certain months everybody got uh, Entigralor and aspirin. Other months they got clopidogrel and aspirin. In most of the costs, uh, or a lot of the costs of um, an RCT is the cost of follow up. So we follow these people up using RAMQ data. Okay, uh, people signed that said that we could uh, go and check their their medical records for rehospitalization or, or death. Uh, so these are ways that we try to. Um, get around some of the uh, issues and uh, some of the cost issues. Uh, and so we ran this uh, from October 2018 to March uh, 2021 uh, through COVID. Uh, and we looked at the, the standard MACE and we also looked at the safety outcome and we had follow up for 12 months because most of the RCTs uh, that have looked at the uh, DAP have had a 12 month uh, follow up. The other element that we did is that when we analyzed our proportional hazards models, we didn't analyze them just from a frequentist point of view, which only looks at your data. We said, no, we're gonna analyze this as from a Bayesian perspective. And where then you, you can use your prior knowledge, right? Rather than checking your prior knowledge at the door and just reporting your own study. Now, the, the issue becomes, well, who's prior knowledge, right? Uh, and so this is why people always say that the, the priors are the Achilles heel of a Bayesian analysis. Uh, I, I don't think that that's the case personally. I, I think it's a strength because it forces you to be transparent and say, what prior are you using? There's nothing hidden the way there are things that are hidden in the frequentist analysis. And so what we did is we looked at four different priors. A vague prior, which means it's just our data, which is giving the results. We did a, a, a skeptical prior, which sort of said, okay, what if we just consider the results from Plato, the North American group, which is the most like ours, but is the most unlike the, their, their answer. So skeptical with regards to the efficacy of tiger lore. Or we used an enthusiastic prior which would be the overall Plato estimate, or we used a summary prior, which would mean we took the result from our Bayesian meta-analysis and used that as a prior. So we used four different priors to combine and to see how uh, our results would uh, come. And, and, you know, it makes kind of sense. You know, if you apply for a grant, you can't get a grant unless you've shown that you've done some sort of meta-analysis uh, of the, you know, of the past research, right? You, that, that's a fundamental thing that you have to do. You have to review the literature, at least do a systematic review, and probably a meta-analysis to kind of justify why you want to do your study. Then you do your study and you're expected to report it completely independently and divorced from any prior knowledge. Well, if the, if the prior knowledge it, it, it is not relevant, that makes sense. But if it is relevant, it doesn't make much sense to me to be ignoring your prior knowledge. And really, that's all the Bayesian approach is trying to do, is it's taking your prior knowledge and your new data, and it's fusing them together according to Bayes' theorem, just according to the laws of probability. So what did we do? Well, we managed to <coughs> randomize uh, just over a 1,000 uh, patients uh, and you can see there's imbalance between the groups. Uh, this is largely because some months during uh, COVID, uh, there were fewer cases that were done. And uh, so it is what it is. This is because of the, the, the cluster nature of the randomization. Um, we really, we excluded uh, 400 people who, who wouldn't sign a consent form, which I will mention on passant. In, in Ontario, um, I know this because I, I chair a committee at McMaster on some research stuff. And th for this sort of study, they would not have needed a consent form because Tiagralor is a, an accepted treatment, uh, Clopidogrel is an accepted treatment. And the fact that you're giving one one month and one another month 
there's no need for randomization. They're both acceptable treatments. There's nothing experimental going on with regards to the drug that the patient is receiving. Um, and so they would just do it. I mean, I'm always amazed, but this is what, how, how they do them. Whereas here, uh, we had a seven page consent form, right? And anyway, we lost 400 patients, uh, 469 who didn't agree to be included. Um, this is the, 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 the results of the, the, <clears throat> the patients. Uh, you can see that, um, uh, although maybe you can't see from back there, you can barely see from here, but uh, the, the, the groups are well balanced, um, as you would expect. Uh, not perfect because the sample size isn't uh, um, uh, that large. For example, the clopidogrel looks like they're about a year and a half older. Um, but, um, you know, with a, with a small sample size, you're going to get some imbalance. But overall, things are, are, are fairly well balanced. <clears throat> so what did our results show? Well, the kappa Mara curve for, for, for MACE, there is, there's overlap. We didn't see any, uh, any difference, any statistically significant difference uh, between the Tigerlor group and the uh, uh, Clopidogrel group. Tigerlor seemed to do a little bit better, but not statistically significant. Now, we weren't expecting that with only you know, a thousand patients that we were going to get a statistically significant answer. What we were hoping to achieve and what we did achieve was to get more information, more evidence, and to be able to use that evidence to update our prior understanding about this question, right? And so the fact that we didn't, on our own merit, uh, see a difference was, was really not surprising uh, in terms of what we were projecting our, our, our power to be. Uh, similarly for bleeding, uh, we didn't have any signal uh, that there was in increased bleeding with, uh, with tiger oil. So here are, are the results. Again, just concentrate on the on the mace for the for the moment. Um, slides a bit a bit busy, but but just stay on the top line. Um, you can see that what we had it was um, uh, over one year as about eleven percent events in both groups, right? When we analyze that uh, from uh, from the Bayesian perspective. Uh, with a vague prior, which again means we're just looking at our data. The, the, the prior is, you know, essentially adding one observation. Uh, you can see that uh, it's uh, the 95% the credible intervals uh, cover one. We can break that down and, and look at the posterior distribution so that we can talk about uh, this region of practical equivalence and whether something is clinically significant or not, as opposed to being just locked into P equals 0 0.05. So what we define here in that uh, on the far right uh, under the posterior distribution, those three columns, the middle one, we said if the hazard ratio is between 0 0.9 and 1.1, we're gonna say that the two drugs are equivalent. If it's less than 0 0.9, we're going to say that there's a superiority for tiger lore. If it's greater than 1.1, there's superiority for uh, <coughs> clopidogrel. So in our case by ourselves, uh, just with our data, we had about a 35% probability that tiger lore was superior, about a 25% probability that clopidogrel was clinically superior. And of course, you can argue about where you want to put these, these, these values, and you can just change them wh whichever way you want to justify. Because you have the probability distribution, you can change the cut wherever you want. Um, and about a 40% probability that the two are <coughs> uh, clinically uh, exchangeable. So what happens when we use some of the other different priors? You know, let's say, for example, using what we call the skeptical prior, which said, okay, let's look at all the previous North American evidence that we had from RCTs. Okay, now remember that was 1.25. We had 0.97, so not surprising. This is sort of a weighted average between the two, right? 
and but it's it crosses one, uh, so it's not statistically significant. But because of this Bayesian perspective, it does allow us to gain some additional insights. For example, now we can see that what's the probability that it is less than zero point nine. Okay. Well, you see 0 0.9 there, so you know, the half of your thing. So you know it's about 2%. So the probability, if we take the prior knowledge that we have from North American patients, the probability that Tigerlor is clinically superior, right, is about 2%. The probability that it is equivalent to uh, uh, clopidogrel is about 38%, and the probability that uh, clopidogrel is superior is 60 percent okay well you can say yeah but you're, you, i don't like using that skeptical prior uh give me the whole plato study right In the plato study the point estimate was 0 0.84 ours is higher again there's a <laughs> a weighted average but since there's so many more patients in uh, plato the weighted average goes towards the the, the plato and you can see what the uh, uh, credible intervals are. And, but then you can see over here that those last three columns again, taking our data with the Plato data, there's about a 55% chance that Tigerlor is clinically superior, has a ratio less than 0 0.9, about a coin toss. 40% uh, chance that it's an equivalent there's almost no chance that uh, uh, clopidogrel is superior, maybe a 3% chance, right? If you want to say, well, I think the best thing to do is to use all the evidence that you generated with your Bayesian meta-analysis, all right? That's the fourth file, right? And again, you can see that in doing that, you have about a 24% chance that Tigerlor is better. 70% chance that the two are the same, and a uh, minuscule 4% chance that Tigerlor is better. You can go through the same steps uh, for the bleeding. We'll leave that for you to look at. Um, this is just the same thing. I'm not sure why it's been repeated. Uh, you can also take these things and, and you know see how they're generated by uh, by making the probability density plots, and then the probability just comes from the area under the curve, under the curve of these probability density plots. Uh, the same thing for bleeding. So the conclusions from our RCT, well, we're the first RCT to compare uh, Tigerlor to Capugil in North America since 2009. They had about 1,800 patients, so we increased the evidence base by about 50%. Um, with a vague prior, we I uh, didn't see any uh, <laughs> any benefit, but obviously there's considerable uncertainty. Um, when we start adding in our priors, uh, we can see that <laughs> with the North American prior, there's only about a 2% probability of a clinically meaningful benefit with Tiger. If we then sort of say, no, we want to do the Bayesian meta-analysis uh, prior, the all comers, all evidence, we have about a 24% probability that Tigerlor is superior, 72% equivalent, and 4% worse. We have the weak evidence, uh, probability about 20% of increased bleeding with uh, Tigerlor, but nothing that is very conclusive. So uh, in this case, I think all roads lead to Rome. With the, the evidence, whether it's from a, a reanalysis of the Plato study, taking into account the hierarchical nature of the data, so using a hierarchical model, um, whether it's using the Bayesian meta-analysis, whether it's our, our local Quebec pharmacoepi study, or whether it's our randomized trial, all of them seem to point in the same direction that there is no clear signal, no clear con conclusive signal that Tigerlor is better. Um, there is, uh, uh, however, a indisputable signal that uh, Tigerlor costs about $1,000 a year more per patient, um, which translates to roughly somewhere between $25 and $30 million extra each year to the Quebec healthcare system. 
So, you know, ultimately the choice is yours. I think that looking at all these different designs, um, there is a, a triangulation, a, a, a convergence that there is no strong signal for the superiority of tiger lore over clopidogrel. And I'll stop there and just to acknowledge the work of, uh, again, of uh, Stephen and his uh, thesis and uh, some of the financial support that we had along the way. Um, and uh, I'll open for any questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay, once again, for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, you never disappoint. So uh, we do have some questions in the chat. Okay, so Sasha Bernaski uh, is asking, there seems to be potential for a large decrease in mortality in your RCT, though. But there, there is, um, uh, Sasha, there is uh, some difference in mortality. However, the numbers are very, very small. Uh, the confidence intervals are very wide. Um, so, and they were really, that's really a secondary outcome. The the primary outcome was was MACE. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that we can always use more evidence um, uh, to further refine um, uh, that. But we did see um, a little bit uh, uh, more mortality with uh, clopidogrel. Uh, but again, the numbers are exceedingly small and uh, I, I wouldn't hang my hat much on that. Ash also wants to know um, a general question about how clinical trials are done by pharma. I guess who designs so, clinical so, trials? So actually, it, it's because I, again, like you never disappoint. It's, it's a pleasure to hear you present because you help everybody to think about things differently. So it seems to me like maybe it's a common theme that in order to get a large study done, pharma would have to um, enroll across many countries and it seems like please correct me because I don't know that much about it it seems like often they do come from whatever eastern european countries or maybe south uh, american countries so basically countries that are different from ours from what, what I mean different from canada but like you know there are many other, other countries that are different from eastern european countries or south american countries or wherever the bulk of of pharma trials seems to uh, enroll from so I've seen um, problems with safety arise in 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 large in these kind of trials because you know for example there's there's a big signal for TB but it only comes from certain countries where TB is endemic. So I'm wondering is this a common what you showed us is it not a potentially underpinning a whole lot of what pharma does? So. Uh... Thank you, Sasha, for the question. Listen, I, I think that the in general, the sort of analyses that we are doing for, because we, we've moved from an era where you used to need, from an FDA point of view, you needed to have two randomized trials that you know were showing a benefit. Now, pharma has argued that now we're doing these big you know, mega trials. It's not reasonable to ask us to do two of them. And so in the last... You know, in the, in the last decade, um, trials and drugs have gotten approved with one mega trial across many different regions, uh, which which is totally understandable. Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to to you know uh, put a, a uh, baton dans dans les rues, you know, a stick in the wheels of uh, of pharma. Uh, but what I'm saying is that if you are going to do that sort of study, then you should analyze it properly. And properly means analyzing it in a hierarchical manner, also known as mixed effects and all sorts of other names. But and, and what that does essentially is it takes into account the variation within and between studies. Right. And it allows you to borrow information between them. And if there is no variation between countries, well, then you get the analysis that shows up regularly in the New England anyway, just that, you know, tight confidence line. And that's fine if that's what it is. But it should be analyzed in a hierarchical model. So I think that, you know, to get back to your question, I think there's nothing wrong and it's understandable. 
that they want to do studies in a uh, timely manner, that they're going to recruit over many regions, many different healthcare systems. And I think that that's all fine. I just think the analysis should be the appropriate analysis that takes into account that between region variation, and that's a hierarchical uh, analysis. It doesn't have to be Bayesian. I, I mean, I think that I would always do Bayesian, but you can do frequentist uh, hierarchical analysis as well. I think you may have answered. Uh, there's a comment from uh, David Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt, sorry. Uh, how would you approach uh, diseases which are very expensive therapies and making decisions for the higher costs? Yeah. So, well, I mean, you know, I, all I'm talking about today is, you know, how do we uh, evaluate the efficacy component uh, of of a study? Uh, the efficacy and the safety. Uh, obviously, if you're making decisions uh, about accepting a drug and then you're you're going to factor in other domains, um, you know, the quality of life, the cost, the ethics, uh, you know, what's expected in your society, where do you draw lines, it, it becomes much more difficult. This is just one part of that pie, right? And I, I'm not today, you know, ready to get into the decision making of how we deal with high cost drugs in general. But, you know, certainly I think we should all be able to agree that one of the components of that would be to have a good treatment effect measure, a good efficacy measure, one that really reflects the uncertainty that's associated with your data and not to be working with, uh, you know, what would be falsely secure data that we implies that we know much more than we really do. There's a comment from uh, Luis Pilot there, question for Pilot, maybe there are ethnic differences in efficacy of certain drugs or greater effect in, in Asian subgroups. Yeah, so that's very interesting uh, because uh, it, it's been said that clopidogrel in particular, uh, because of the P450 activation, um, you know, in, in Asians would not do very well in, in Asian populations. And there's actually one study that compared Tiagrelor to clopidogrel, an RCT, done specifically in an Asian population uh, called Philo, and where you would expect all the things to be lined up in favor of Tiagrelor, and lo and behold, clopidogrel won out in that trial. So, yeah, I think we do... Treatment heterogeneity is a big issue. We have to be co cognizant of it, but it doesn't always go in the direction that we might have expected. Hi, Charles Frenette. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, a comment and a question. Uh, the illustration of your country-specific data, it, it was very well illustrated. The one of the trial we participated, N95 versus procedure mask for COVID. We had four countries, Canada, the States, India, and Egypt. And overall, so no difference. But it was driven by the fact that we recruited much, much more in Egypt and India. And that the risk of acquiring COVID in those countries was way higher in the community than in hospital. So it diluted completely uh, the small benefit that we actually had shown in North America. <laughs> And, and it was one example that we could explain why the, it was a country-specific uh, effect, just because the community risk in one country was much higher than in the other country. Uh, you, you neglected the, the mortality effect, but it seemed consistent amongst all your hypotheses. Uh, I, I was far, I'm not, I wasn't sure, but it was significant, at least in a couple of lines. Yeah, I'd like to, I can't, I, unfortunately, I can't, I can't go back yeah. to the slide. But I just wanted, and the, you know, as a follow that it was relatively short term, uh, a couple of years. Yeah, it's one, think, one year. One year, yeah. Don't you think it's something that we should, maybe there are well, other, other ways that. So, so I, I think that for the, our mortality data by itself, um, you know, if you flip one or two patients from one group to another, um, the, the effect it totally disappears. So we really don't have, you know, I don't think very strong evidence. The, the, the signal was in favor of Tiger Lord, 
But when we consider that that was not our primary endpoint, our primary endpoint was maize. When we consider all the other elements that I ran through, I'm not ready to put very much uh, weight on it. Your question uh, about 12 months, 12 months has been the standard in all the um, uh, ACS studies. For some reason, cardiologists sort of after ACS feel that things only last for 12 months. But, um, the, the, but given the difficulty we had in running this trial, when the patients signed the consent form, they signed to let us get their data at three years and five years. So we are going to look at that at, at three and five years, and uh, hopefully uh, we won't see any uh, progression of that uh, of that signal. So you, you're quite right; we are intending to look at that further. Perfect. We're coming up on the hour. I'll let you answer Dr. Rosenblatt. He was uh, saying that it was about rare disease, so I'll let you answer that because it is coming up on the hour. Dr. Rosenblatt, I'll ask uh, Dr. Brophy to answer that in the chat. Uh, thanks, everyone. Jay, uh, once again, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Very thought-provoking. I think uh, don't assume you know what you know just because you're reading clinical trials, and including the New England Journal of Medicine. Don't, to, to, to the, especially to the trainees out there, don't assume that everything is uh, as it as it appears. Uh, things are much more complicated, as Dr. Brophy likes to remind us. So uh, thanks for uh, reminding us of that. And if uh, people have any questions about doing, I think the cluster randomized control trials are very interesting, lower cost, uh, much more attainable. And, and plus the, the Bayesian element, I think, is, is, is so key because if you're a point of CHR, they, they're not going to give you 20 million or 50 million dollars. But if you can say, you know, that we can refine and get a more clinically meaningful answer by randomizing an additional 500 or 700 patients to a study that has already been done, but is a bit inconclusive, um, you, you have a shot. So uh, I, my pitch would be, you know, make sure you consider doing Bayesian analyses as as a, as an approach to you know doing RCTs. They're not all RCTs are not out of our range. We can even with the you know, Chinsey old CHR do do them. Fantastic. Thank you, Jay. Thanks everyone for joining us. I wish everyone a great afternoon. Dr. Rosenblatt, Dr. Brophy, staying just for you. Okay, Jay. Okay. No, you're more than welcome. Uh, I'm not sure how. We can talk. We don't have oh. to write. <laughs> so what was exactly was the Oh, you can of... talk. Actually, yeah. he's here. Look, you oh, can talk. Yeah, I was just saying, I was talking about when you, we have so many situations now where these very expensive things, very rare diseases where the numbers are, are very small. How do you get to do, you know, any rational analysis? You know, people yeah. pick up biomarkers uh, so, so that may or may not be meaningful, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So again, I, I guess I would go back to to wearing my Bayesian hat a little bit by by saying that it, you know certainly with rare diseases, you know you're not going to be randomizing you know hundreds or whatever number of patients. But I think this is a a, 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 a situation where you probably have maybe you have a couple of small studies that have been previously done that have been done well. And you can use those as your prior. And then so you do your study, which again, and maybe is, is very small, but the Bayesian paradigm lets you incorporate and continue to learn and to refine your estimates as you move along. Um, you know, I mean, it's not going to solve every single problem, but I think it is one step that might help, particularly when you're you know, looking at, at, at situations where you have little evidence, in this case, because it's a rare disease. So I would I would always say, you know, my answer to most questions is think Bayesian and maybe it'll help you. Maybe it'll make no, maybe it'll make no difference, but maybe it, maybe it will help. Well, obviously, in genetics, in our daily practice, we, we are do, we're using Bayesian bottom line because we're always talking about, you know, um, uh, we have a lot of trouble with screening tests with prior predictive values. And yes, then, exactly, exactly. And age-specific age populations. And, you know, so we see this with the non-invasive uh, prenatal screening, which I don't know if you've ever looked at any of that data. You wouldn't yeah. necessarily, but it's very fascinating. So so I, I think that this is what's one of the things that really fascinates me is that we, uh, 
you know, I think physicians, at least these people that we've we've looked up to and sort of say, man, they got such a flair. They know what to do, when to order, when not to order. They they seem to have some innate ability to to deal with predictive values going across the two by two table rather than going up and down in the sensitivity and specificity. They know to go across and they they know what the prevalence is so they can fill in their table. And all I'm saying is that there is a direct analogy between what we do in how we look at two by two tables in diagnostic testing and how we look at clinical trial data. And if we can do it for our diagnostic testing, okay, with, you know, going with the predictive values, we can do it with the RCTs as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it will provide us with the same sort of extra insights that we get from calculating predictive values, uh, as opposed to sticking with test sensitivity and specificity. Anyway, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed listening to that, even as an outsider. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Take care.